Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, our play-by-email game against XTRG. Uh, this is, I think, episode 62, 61, something like that. We're more than two months into the war, folks. Uh, not quite, I guess, technically, December 7th, we're on September, we're on February 4th. Uh, but nonetheless, we are uh, making progress in this conflict, and it's exciting. And the Japanese have sort of launched a new wave of offensives here uh, in New Guinea, landing all along the coast of New Guinea. Um, they've expanded their, their landings on um, the island of New Britain. And they've also begun to land on uh, Southern of the Dutch East Indies, taking most of Celebs and also taking uh, the important bases uh, in East Timor. So um, the conflict is spreading. The Japanese advance is uh, quickening. And uh, that is the situation right now. Meanwhile, our S-41 launching more torpedoes at an enemy cargo ship here off the port of Kandari, a newly taken Dutch East Indies uh, base uh, in the uh, Dutch East Indies. Um, <laughs> and uh, the torpedoes missed. It looks like S-41 is returning to the party and hits the Eco Maru with a torpedo uh, a little bit shy of midships. Uh, the good thing is the S-boats do have Mark 10 torpedoes, so they are a little bit effective. So again, a nice little torpedo uh, hit here on the Eco Maru number two. And we get the splash sound effects, so we know that the Eco Maru sank, or at least we presume that she sank, and that's a, a nice little ship kill there for us of an enemy cargo ship, uh, which is always nice. We, we see that far too rarely, and I think I'm probably going to have to realign where my submarines are based, to be honest, or at least where their patrol lines are, because I have not... I don't feel I've accomplished anything with my submarine so far. There's been, I think, one hit we recorded on an enemy cruiser, which was nice. And we've sunk a couple of cargo ships, but it doesn't feel like we're really picking up on any of his shipping, any of his convoys. And I don't know if there just aren't a lot of convoys out there that he's just not starting his economic war yet. Or I, I, I don't really know what. All I can say is it feels like there should be more convoys, especially in sort of the South China Sea area. Um, you would expect large numbers of convoys transiting back and forth between China and Japan, especially with the aggressiveness that he's been pushing in China. I don't know if you guys know this, but typically my understanding is the way the game works and the huge number of Japanese troops in China, China does produce resources and Japan does own many of those factories. But the fact of the matter is, if, if Japan is pursuing an aggressive China policy, which XTRG certainly has been, then Japan often has to ship tens of thousands of supply into China to keep those advances going. So I haven't really seen much in the way of convoys going back and forth between Japan and Shanghai or anything like that. And I've been I've loaded the seas up with, with subs and either he's just avoiding me and doing a good job of that or, or he's completely delaying some of that, which could lead him to some headache later. At least, again, that's my understanding is that China can be a huge supply drain on the Japanese economy. And in fact, I was talking with uh, Belugan about this. One of the things that uh, one of the effective strategies for an allied player is if you if you fight a somewhat active China campaign, you can't be too active because your own limitations in supply. But if you fight a somewhat active China campaign, you can actually limit the Japanese economy's ability to produce fighters and other things because what they end up being stuck doing is they need to save some of their economy, some of their resources, some of their supply to go to China to help fight the war there. Um, and that's one way you can help limit how many fighters and bombers and other things like that they can produce is by, in fact, making them fight a war uh, that uses lots of supplies. Go figure. Anyway, Japanese are bombing Palembang, or at least the uh, port area around it. Looks like they're going for some mine layers, or sorry, motor launches. Uh, I always confuse the ML for a, for a motor launch. Um, so yeah, I don't think these guys are mine layers. These are just kind of small little motor boats that they're dropping a lot of ordnance on and, and using supplies up. They did, looks like they shot down one of our Dutch B-339D uh, fighter aircraft, but nonetheless, um, not a very effective strike. Certainly a net drain on the Japanese resources, especially when you don't hit anything. Um, meanwhile, also, Quick Park, thank you for the follow. Idle uh, Germ 831294, thank you for the follow uh, as well. Uh, more Japanese bombing of Changsha here. Remember a couple of, was it a couple of turns ago or was it last turn? They launched a, a, a deadly attack on uh, the air, on the troops there, losing over 16,000 casualties to only 4,000 Japanese or Chinese casualties. Changsha was a bloodbath for the Japanese. And so since then they've pulled back. They aren't launching ground attacks, or at least they haven't since then. And they are dropping bombs with their uh, army bombers here. 12 airbase hits, 10 supply hits, 50 runway hits. That's a pretty effective strike there uh, with a good 
air fighter wing to protect them, about 40 innate fighter planes flying top cover, so um, not an easy target to hit. Meanwhile, we've got 35 Japanese Sally Ki-21 two uh, bombers coming in towards Singapore, and we jumped back some Aero Cobras and some of our Dutch fighters based out of Dijabi. Uh, in an effort to try and surprise the Japanese because they had been sending in large numbers of unescorted bombers against Singapore. Unfortunately for us, they did not go in unescorted. Uh, they did go in with some Ki-27 Nates. The good news for us is that the Nate sucks, and so we've got 15 or 14 of our fighters here up against, against 14 enemy fighters, and then if they can break through the fighter screen, maybe they can take down some of the enemy Sally bombers or at least make the raid less effective uh, and not allow them to really knock out too much in the way of... Um, of our ground troops, which they will be bombing. THD butchers. Um, yes. All right, we're going to fast forward through this uh, air combat phase a little bit and just we'll see what happens. It doesn't look like we hit any of the bombers, unfortunately. Uh, we reported one Sally damage, no Allied aircraft loss. Well, that was a bit of an underwhelming fighter intercept there. Damn it. Doesn't look like the bombing did too much, so I guess that's the one saving grace. Meanwhile, a bunch of bombers flying in over Changsha. More Nates and Lilies, another eight of our uh, Buffaloes and one of our Air Cobras. I'm just going to fast forward through this. A bunch more nades coming in. Got a nice little flak hit there on a the lily, and we engaged him on the way out. Uh, looks like we damaged eight lilies with flak. I'm assuming one destroyed with flak. No allied air losses. Six Sonia's going into Changsha. Nine Sonia's going into Changsha. If there was a way I could be like, hey guys, don't intercept anything until it's uh, until. You know, the PM phase. Of course, that would be a probably gamey, because then you would also assume that you'd be able to direct your cap to only fly in the PM phase. Anyway, some Catalinas flying out of Surabaya against something don't end up engaging anything. So that was fun. Bunch of recon going on. I'm raising my rake pinky and sipping some scotch. Another raid here over Palembang. Some Bettys are approaching. So this is the second raid he sent, sent into Palembang. Again, it does nothing. But it does indicate, indicate to us perhaps he will make a move such as he did at Timor toward Palembang or somewhere on Sumatra. All right, so we've got more... Um, Scout planes off the coast of Australia. Again, we knew that uh, he had at least an element or some of the ki the mini Kidu Butai is off the northwest coast of Australia. We've been kind of scrambling ships and tankers and all these other things around and away to try and avoid uh, getting bombed. I think we lost one tanker, and it was a light tanker, nothing too valuable. I'm not sure if we lost a second or not. I can't remember. Um, but we had like 12 in the area, so... Uh, those losses would certainly be acceptable for uh, what is a, a very risky deployment, I think, on his end uh, to rush his, uh, his light carriers way out there. Um, maybe he's trying to lure our carriers into a, a trap, but I don't think there's any way his major kitty boot or his major um, kitty boot I guess the main one, the main force, the main KB. I don't think there's any way it's in the region yet because last time we saw it, it was uh, near Rabal and that was only a couple of days ago, so unless he's sprinting and burning vast amounts of fuel, it's unlikely they uh, got there. Meanwhile, the Japanese are now launching another deliberate attack against Nomaya, which is held out against the Japanese for almost maybe more than three weeks of continued assaults by overwhelming numbers. Um, this is, again, an overwhelming Japanese force. Uh, we will see if our troops can hold out any longer or if this is the end of the road for these troops, again, who have put up a heroic effort against the Japanese and delayed the fall of the southernmost position and the island of New Caledonia, just to the east of Australia, uh, farther south than any advance Japan historically made. All of our assault values down to zero, that's not a good sign. Japanese are still attacking, we'll fast forward here. Japanese capture Nomaya and our units surrender. 
Well, it was a long time coming. We knew it was coming, but at the end of the day, the Japanese finally managed to capture the base at Nomaya. Um, it took three plus weeks. We did lose two aircraft destroyed on the ground. The Japanese lost a further 278 casualties in the final battle. Another squad destroyed. That's another victory point. Uh, but at the end of the day, almost 4,000 prisoners head into captivity. Uh, hopefully we will not read history books of the death march of Nomaya or New, New Caledonia. Uh, 3,910 Allied casualties in the final engagement. 39 squads destroyed. That's not too bad. Uh, 275 non-combatant squads destroyed. That's quite a lot. Uh, but still is actually less than his failed attack at Changsha last turn. So even after all of this, the victory point value of the failed Japanese attack a couple of turns ago at Changsha exceeds the Japanese haul at Nomaya in terms of victory points again. Uh, 275 non-combatants captured, 31 engineer squads, 81 guns destroyed, 18 vehicles destroyed, 5 units destroyed. And there they go, off into the horizon. Thank you, Fear the, Fear the Beard... Beard... Ed? Fear the Beard Ed. Uh, thank you for the follow. And Kwai055137 as well. Thank you for the follow. All right. Japanese deliberate attack here in some random place in southeast China. And they succeed and drive back a uh, Chinese corps here. Um, 75 squads destroyed. Thankfully, for in this case, uh, the allied Chinese squads are basically worthless. It's like six squads equals one victory point. So um, a defeat there nonetheless. He is driving that unit. Japanese deliberate attack at Nanning again. Uh, this time again, or was it the first time? I think it was the second one. Uh, they fail to take the base. One to two Japanese assault odds. Fort level one holds them off. Uh, the defender has a terrain bonus, but not an experience bonus. The ally has, a penal has an attacking penalty. Uh, the Japanese lose one squad destroyed, two disabled. Uh, the Chinese lose zero squads destroyed, one disabled. 16 non-combatants disabled on the Chinese end. Uh, 36 to 96 casualties. It almost feels like a skirmish compared to everything else we've seen. Meanwhile, near the Sarum Sea, the Japanese are attacking at Namlia, uh, and they capture the base. There was no one there opposing them, so shocker, they won. Allied bombardment attack at Ambion. I don't know why we're wasting the supply, but we did. So I should probably tell those guys to not do that. Gassadama on the island of New Britain is attacked by the 24th Infantry Regiment, or at least elements of it. And again, no defenders there, so of course they take the base. Um, Japanese deliberate attack at Lei. Again, no more defenders here. Those brave, brave Japanese are overrunning palm trees and uh, tortoises and... and Nothing that can shoot back those vicious, vicious Japanese divisions just overran a platoon of uh, fish on the beach there. Um, but they, uh, they did manage to take the base, surprisingly. And... Okay. So, Siangatan uh, expands its fortifications to level 3. Melbourne to level 3. Colombo to level 2. Palmyra to level 2. Uh, those are all good results for us there. Um, I can't click. It keeps bringing me to the bottom of the list. All right. Well, that's going to be the end of the turn. So we'll jump in and take a look at uh, things here in a moment. Uh, we'll see what uh, vehicles or ships or whatever uh, come into service this turn. I don't think there's a ton. I think there's some cargo ships. I think we've got some battleships coming online tomorrow. Meanwhile, a victory point penalty at Mandalay. Not enough troops there. A couple of cargo ships here. Um, a new, some new air squadrons arriving in Aden. And that's it. Fear the beer, Ed. I'm drinking beer. And I'm drinking scotch. That makes me sound like I have a problem. I don't have a problem, I swear. Believe me, I asked myself. All right. Um, okay, so we're into the turn. And where do we start? Uh First thing, I guess, New Caledonia is now Japanese. We can see that. So the entire island is Japanese. So they extend their control northeast to Espirito Santo, uh, which according to this is now a level 3 airfield, which uh, would allow them to control a lot of this sea lane. The fall of Nomaya can build it up to an airbase of level 5. It's already level 2. Meanwhile, uh, Comac can be a 7, but it doesn't look like they've started to build it yet. They probably will use Nomaya to control this sea lane down here. Fortunately for us, we can just divert our shipping a little bit further south to New Zealand and we'll be fine. Uh, they can't reach this far south. 
Um, meanwhile, our bases east of Nomaya are still fine. They could start bombing uh, Suva and Fiji from here, but we actually have uh, probably enough fighters to withstand any realistic uh, concerted effort. We have 53 fighters. 52 of them are ready. Um, we've got 17 Warhawks of the P-40 variant. We've got 18 Wildcats, 17 Buffaloes. Those aren't great aircraft, but the odds of him being able to mount like 60 Zeros out of Nomaya and flying them towards Suva is pretty far-fetched. Not because he can't do it. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So it's 16 bases. So if we actually take a look at the... Uh, aircraft uh, database, and we go to the A6M20. Uh, it can operate out to... Where is the range? Uh, I don't see it. 16, normal radius is 7. Max radius is 36. With drop tanks, it's 11. 14. Actually, no, they can't fly out there. Uh, they could transfer there. They can fly 36 hexes, but they can only fly 14. So actually, it's out of range for even the A6M20. He could hit it with bombers, but they'd be unescorted unless he brings carriers in. So this is a pretty safe base still, nonetheless. And if he wants to send unescorted bombers, my pilots will be very happy to oblige him and wipe him out. Uh, meanwhile, as we turn Suva into a, an even bigger base and an even bigger airfield, uh, then we can start bombing him uh, with B-17s and other things as our aircraft uh, come into production. We can fly him at high altitude, uh, and we can pound Nomaya into nothingness. I think we still have some B-17s here, don't we? Not many. No, I guess not. I guess we flew them all to Australia. Nonetheless, uh, we are building the airfield up at Suva uh, for just that purpose. And actually, we're already up to a level 5 airfield. The only negative there is if he does take Fiji uh, or Suva, uh, a level 6 airfield, I'm sure would be very handy for him. Uh, nonetheless, we're building up our fortifications there as well. And we have quite a few troops there. We've got almost 300 assault value on the defensive. Um, of those, many are very high-quality troops. We've got the 161st American Army Regiment. We've got the 8th New Zealand Brigade. Both of those are full of regular troops. Troops. And then we've got quite a bit of artillery, three uh, U.S. Uh, base force units. Um, actually, those are not the artillery units that I was thinking about. We've got the 147th and 148th Field Artillery Battalions, uh, both of which will help uh, defending the base. And then we also have a New Zealand uh, base force, which has 3.7-inch naval guns. Uh, and we've got some machine guns and radars and other things like that in the U.S. bases uh, there as well. Um, so nonetheless, it's not a fortress, but we're working our way toward that. Um, Pago Pago further to the east is not quite as well defended, but we have some fighters here, um, some Warhawks here. I'm surprised I can't add drop tanks to these guys. That's kind of annoying. I would love to be able to do that. Then we could really make these bases mutually supporting, but alas, we can't do that quite yet. Um, anyway, um, so New Caledonia fell. Our carriers are still en route to New Zealand. I am probably going to send them to Australia uh, if his uh, light carriers stay in that vicinity. But our four carriers, the Enterprise, Yorktown, Saratoga, and Lexington, still well out of um, out of out of Australia uh, right now. It looks like they are three days away from New Zealand, an early arrival on the third day, but uh, three days away from New Zealand, probably 10 to 14 days away from Perth if we direct him that way. So it's unlikely his carriers will still be around. We actually didn't detect his carriers uh, via via sighting at all. Uh, we do have some ships that are detected by them. We've got a destroyer and a mine layer here that uh, is a full 10 out of 10 detection level. We have, actually this uh, ship has no detection level. Um, so full 10 out of 10 detection level here. Um, we've got a very minimal detection over the port of Carnivon, one out of four. Uh, pretty solid detection over these cargo ships here. We've got three light cargo ships we sent north, largely as decoys. Don't tell their parents, but we sent these guys out here to get killed, uh, rather than more valuable ships like the Tanker Pino, which is uh, a little bit further south and has no detection over it. No detection over the uh, cargo ship down here, the Melanchia. So it would seem that his detection is most strong here, a little bit stronger here. It tells me he's pro maybe maybe here. I don't know. It's a weird it's a weird thing to be to not have any detection on this one ship up here, but it is a small ship too. Um, so perhaps that's why no detection on them. We also have our cruisers charging south here. They are set to max react level six. Uh, so in theory, uh, we could intercept the enemy carriers if we can find them. Um, <laughs> That's a bit of a challenge. I've got some uh, patrol aircraft there that are set uh, to naval search, uh, but so far, no detection there. Uh, I'm not sure how many of these we've got. It looks like we've got five, six. I think we've got, yeah, six 
float planes in this cruiser task force, which is perhaps a little bit reckless. I don't want to get them all sunk way out there on their own. Uh, we have the light cruiser Hermes, which is sailing north and basically out of fuel. Uh, but we've got the battleship Royal Sovereign and uh, J a British crew carrier Indomitable rushing south. They'll be able to share some fuel with the, Indom with the Hermes task force, and then we can kind of decide what we want to do from there. Do we want to send them south and try and cut off the Japanese retreat? If it's even still, you know, possible. They're, they're still three to four days away. The Japanese may be gone in a day or two. But if the Japanese press their advance on Perth, then there may be an opportunity there to to sail some of those forces south and uh, and come up behind the Japanese rear and, and attack them. The cruisers are the ones most at risk. Interestingly enough, the cruisers have zero detection levels over them. Um, not a lot else going on near Cape Town. I had two tankers arrive there that I'm now sending back to the U.S. to pick up more fuel. Um, nothing really over Singapore. Um, you know, we, we still have a couple of aircraft sitting in Singapore. Singapore got bombed. Uh, no surprise there. Uh, the uh, land defenses at Singapore are at about 1,100 defensive value here for all the troops that are here. The 11th Indian, the 9th Indian Divisions, the 22nd, 27th Australian Brigades, the SSVF uh, Malayan Brigade uh, is there as well. Uh, the 2nd of Gordon's Battalion. Uh, we've got some smaller uh, fragments of battalion as well as some Malay battalions. Not a lot of British troops. Yeah, interestingly enough, we pulled almost all the British troops out to India. So, uh, yeah, that's colonialism, I guess. I, I didn't intentionally do that. I just diverted the British division that was on the way. Um, speaking of the British division that was on the way, the 18th British division has started crossing the, the mountains from Impal and Comac. They're going to take a while here. They're about 15 miles into this next hex, which is going to cross the remainder of these mountains and then allow them to start moving toward uh, Miatinkia, uh, and then they can mount rail cars and move south toward Pegu. Um, but that's their situation right there. Meanwhile, on the other flank, the 80, or 63rd Indian Brigade is in the process of starting to cross those mountains. It's about two miles into this next hex. It's got uh, another, you know... I don't know, 62 miles or so before it crosses this mountain range. That'll probably take the better part of a week, maybe more. Uh, but nonetheless, they are moving there. So we're, we've got a brigade and a division both on the way to reinforcing Burma. Burma itself is already relatively strongly uh, acquitted. The 16th Indian Brigade is chasing after uh, the Thai Royal Army Division, which it thrashed in front of Pegu uh, and is chasing it northeast into the mountains. Uh, we also have um, some other elements of the uh, BFF Brigade, which are kind of maintaining their position. Once we thrash this Royal Thai Army Brigade, then we may move south to try and retake Tavoy. Tavoy is a very useful base for the Japanese. It kind of cuts the supply to Rangoon here. Uh, it's a level four airfield, and so he can really shut down supply all around here with Nell and Betty bombers. Uh, so if he does decide to put air wings at Tavoy, that will be a serious headache for us. Speaking of which, we probably should throw some recon over Tavoy. So we're going to go ahead and select uh, our Hurricane Photo Recon aircraft, and they're going to target Tavoy. So they can they can get down there. Uh, we're going to send two uh, air recon groups down there. Actually, we'll send uh, the uh, photo recons of the Hurricanes, and then we're also going to send the photo recons of the Beauforts because th th that's literally these units' job is to co conduct photo reconnaissance of enemy bases. And so we will do both of those down here at Tavoy to get an eye on if the Japanese have placed any air base, any air units there. The only saving grace, the only reason they may not have yet is they will have to divert some of their air support, some of their uh, air army engineer units to be able to really base anything out of there. And we will find out pretty quickly if they do. This is going to be, Tavoy is going to be the base they use to close Pegu and Rangoon to air forces. And it's going to suck. And it's going to happen. And holy shit, Rangoon eats a lot of supply. Um, why does it eat so much supply? Is it because it has a refinery? Light industry? I can't even turn the production off. That's the dumb thing. It's like, hey, guys, you're using all their supply. Maybe we should turn production off. I mean, they can turn oil into fuel, but that's about that's about the only efficient thing they can do. I guess I, guess I can turn that off. There's no reason to do that at the moment. Um, and then, uh, resources, we can turn resource production off as well, can't we? No, we can't. We can turn repair off. 14 manpower. All right, so we're going to turn repair off on the refinery as well. If he does want to bomb it, there's no reason to fix it for him because he's going to benefit from that refinery. Um, because he needs all the fuel production facilities he can get.
Uh, Newhauser, one of the you said go further south with the carriers. Um, carriers have no detection value over them. So the Japanese, as far as we know, the Japanese have not sent anything over these aircraft carriers. Not sure if we got like I know you were talking about the the combat result you looked at. Not sure if there was a false report or what. But according to the game, there is zero detection level over the carriers, which means the Japanese have not spotted them. Um, there could be some element of fog of war, but I'm guessing they're relatively safe because we've got two task forces of very valuable tankers up here headed back to Los Angeles um, up here, uh, and neither of these have detection values over them either. Auckland over Auckland? Meh. Severe storms over Auckland right now. does look like the task force to the north here of some... Uh, Troop transports uh, is uh, detected, so maybe they've got a submarine up in this area that's thrown some reconnaissance over them. We're putting the 34th Combat uh, in combat Regiment of Engineers into Auckland. We're going to build New Zealand up like a son of a bitch to make sure that there's no way they're going to land and take New Zealand. So we've got these combat engineers that are going to be landing at New Zealand. They're going to be adding their firepower here. New Zealand's uh, uh, combat value is going to be up over 250 and uh, it's going to be built up like crazy. I was going to send them originally to Norfolk Island, but here's the problem. Norfolk Island doesn't have a port. The port level is zero. The build-up level is zero. I really can't unload these guys at Norfolk. And even if I do, it's going to take forever to turn this into anything other than a seaplane base. So I'm not going to send anything there. Um, Lord Howe Island uh, it does have a level one port facility, but kind of a similar situation where it has zero airfield. It's an atoll it's not going to be ever effective as a bombing base. It, it, eventually, I suppose, if we spent like months building Lord Howe Island up, we could. But if he tries it, we can just bomb it from, from Oz. So no reason to do that. These islands will keep a picket of destroyers and things like that out front to make sure that he doesn't try to sneak in and take these for seaplane bases. But other than that, they're really not worth a whole lot. They're not even worth a whole lot to him. Two and four victory points, respectively. Not all that important. Um... The loss of Nomaya does hurt. That's a 300 victory point swing. If we take a look at the victory points, I think last turn we were at about 10,700, so now we're down to about 10,400. Um, he's up to 7,200. If we take a look at the ship sunk last turn, nothing sunk except for the one Japanese cargo ship, the Eco Maru number two. We got six victory points for sinking that thing. Um, if we take a look at aircraft losses last turn, 13 Japanese aircraft losses to eight allied aircraft. Looks like he lost five Nates, four to op losses, one air to air. So that might've been over Singapore. Um, he also lost three lilies, two to flak, one operationally. Operationally basically means we didn't shoot it down, but it was rendered, you know, um, not worth, worth repairing. So maybe a B-17 that returns to base with the whole fuselage or a big chunk of the fuselage missing or it's, uh, you know, it's rudder missing and somehow they managed to bring it back to base. Technically, it wasn't shot down by flak or air to air, but it is written off. Uh, meanwhile, we lost three B-339D uh, Buffaloes of the Dutch variety, two in the air, one op loss. We lost two Hudsons uh, and then a slew of single loss aircraft. In terms of pilots, we lost two. Uh, nobody KIA'd uh, on the top pilots list, but we did lose two KIA pilots, one wounded. Ship availability. Um, stuff. We've got the battleship Revenge is arriving at Cape Town tomorrow. Um, the cargo ship Timber Rush is arriving in two days. In three days, we get a couple of cargo ships or troop transports. Um, in four days, we get a bunch. Four to seven days, we get a bunch more cargo ships. And then in about ten days, we, get, we start getting some other battleships. We'll see. I mean, I, I'll, we'll see how it is. I, I don't really have much further south to go, Newhauser. Maybe we will divert next turn and go wide around the southern island. I'm not sure. How's our system damage, by the way? It's fine. Destroyers are starting to run out of gas, but they can refuel from the carriers. Um, let's see. What else is going on? I am sending the S-41 at Kandari back to base. It's basically out of torpedoes. It's uh, down to a single torpedo uh, ammo left, and its system damage is getting up there. We're sending a few of these Dutch subs here. The KV or KXV is going to go ahead and replace it. Uh, we're also sending the KX, uh, I, or KXVII uh, to uh, Mascar as well. Uh, we're pulling this Dutch sub out because it suffered quite a bit of system damage, pulling it back to Sorbaea. 
uh, and those are kind of some different moves that we're making uh, this turn. Um, do we need to pull anything out of here? Do we have any ships? Yeah, I guess let's form a surface task force. Ah, uh, shit. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Can we form, what can we form? A mine lane task force? Can the cruiser go with it? Yes, I can. Okay. So we're going to bring the light cruiser, the Dutch light cruiser Sumatra, and the mine layers Guden Lu and Krakatau. Uh, we're going to move them south uh, to, uh, I guess, to Darwin. It's probably the safest spot. Hoping to avoid the bulk of any Japanese air threats. Can we flank speed them? Would that be possible? Or is there not enough fuel? We can almost flank speed them. We could probably flank speed them for a day and then move them into standard standard movement speeds. Okay, so that's going to evacuate the port of Surabaya. Uh, Batavia still has some stuff up there. These guys are headed to Colombo. This stuff's up here is pretty much out of reach for the Japanese so far, but Surabaya is well within their, within their bombing range. Uh, to that effect, let's do this. Do we have some torpedo bombers? We do. Some of these... Oops. Some of these guys were evacuating to Latin. All right, so that's all of the Wildebeest. All the biplanes are out of the Dutch East Indies. Um, these guys can't fly very far, so they're going to have to fly north. Can't even fly there. We're going to have to evacuate some of these aircraft units uh, north into India because they can't reach anywhere else. Um, these Catalinas can fly to Oz. So we'll do that. I'm assuming they can make it there. It's a long flight. 40 hexes, they gotta be able to make it there. If not, they gotta be able to make it darn close. No, they can't. Interesting. Probably... Broom? Oh, they're in a restricted... Okay, never mind. They're a Dutch unit with a restricted headquarters. I was thinking Catalina immediately would be American, but I guess not. You know, all this group is. They can evacuate. I'm not sure if they can fly that far, though. Oh, yep, they can make it there. Those are uh, RAF Catalinas. Um, and then this one is American, right? So we'll fly it to Broome as well. Actually, we can use those against the Japanese carriers, too. Now that we're pulling them back to Broome, we can use them to try and detect any Japanese carriers in the area. So that, that'll be nice. All right, that's the patrol aircraft. Transport nobody, recon nobody. Level bombers. There's some Dutch ones, but we're not flying those out of here. I guess the uh, whirlways maybe. What would we upgrade them to? Their upgrade path really doesn't have... I guess a lot on it. Still, I don't want to just like leave them to die. So we'll fly them to Palembang, I guess. Then we'll fly them out into India, because they have an unrestricted headquarters unit. Uh, the Hudsons... Can they make it to Broome too? Yes. Nice. Okay, so most of our Dutch bombers can make it to Broome. Um, I am pulling most of these guys out just because with the way the Japanese have landed in the south, it's cutting out. Oh, I can't can't get them out. Those guys are restricted. Whatever. Anyway, I'll probably do most of this off, off screen. Uh, that's probably enough of showing you guys this at this moment. Uh, but long-winded way of saying that uh, the Japanese have already cut our retreat line to the south. We have a lot of aircraft that we're not going to be able to really do a whole lot with out of Java. Uh, most of them are largely worthless, and so I am going to end up pulling a bunch of them out uh, to where we can get them to fight more effectively. So uh, we are moving a lot of American fighters into Rangoon and into Burma to make a big fight there, uh, and then we will probably move what we can to Australia, although the seizure of Copang and the distance of Latinum means that most of our fighters will not be able to reach Timor and Australia. Okay... Um, that's most of what we have this turn. Um, not a lot has changed in China. We still have about 4,600 assault value here at Changsha. 
I think actually it may have recovered a little bit from after the attack. I think it was like 46 flat, now it's 4666, despite all the bombing. Still only level 5 fortification building up toward level, uh, sorry, level 5% building back up to level four, 5 forts. We're at level 4 at the moment. So that kind of sucks. But all of our, uh, all of our, all of our soldiers there are still in supply. Nobody's out of supply. Nobody's red or pink or anything like that from a supply perspective. Same for the troops in the north here in the mountains, just east of Cyan. The attack on uh, Nanning failed uh, this last turn yet again. Uh, we are moving some troops in that direction. So I think we've got the 66th Chinese Corps, which is moving to Nan Nanning. It's already at 30 miles there. Um, we're also moving the 65th Chinese Corps that way. Uh, are we moving the 31st too? We are moving the 31st there too. So they're about a third of the way there. If Nanning can hold out for another day or two, we may give this ja this uh, Japanese force a rude surprise with over 700 assault value coming up their rear uh, and perhaps crushing them. It sure would be nice to crush a Japanese land force in China. Not just, repul not just repulse, but crush. We must crush. Um, yes. Uh, meanwhile, we're up to 20, 20 of the Flying Tigers are reorganized back here at Chongqing. We're continuing to slowly filter out these aircraft here at Changtheth as, uh, as they get repaired. Um, not a lot else going on this turn. We've, we've got some amphibious uh, craft unloading some aircraft here uh, at, uh, in India. So some RAF squadrons have arrived at uh, Karachi here. Um, we've got some Hudson 3As. We've got some... Uh, what else is on those, on those, are they, what are on those ships? It says there's troops, or are these just RAF support? No, these are hurricanes. So we got 14 hurricanes on this. Um, Catalinas on this one. So we got Catalinas, we've got hurricanes, and we've got Blenheim Force. All, uh unloading here uh, in Karachi and we can send them via the rail network uh, toward the border of Burma and then we can send them across into Burma as well so that'll be that'll be nice meanwhile the 7th Australian division has finally left the Middle East uh, the 30,291 soldiers of the 7th or sorry 6th Australian division as well as some RAF supporting aircraft are on their way to Perth I don't know why it gives me that weird supply line or whatever because that's not the direction they're going we also have 15,000 soldiers, RAF support for the most part, uh, all on their way toward Karachi. So that'll give us a lot more air assault support. Uh, and then we've got uh, over 26,000 fuel, 33,000 fuel, uh, and another 25,000 fuel, all on their way to India to help power the economy there. Speaking of fuel, we have fuel unloading at Perth. Um, some 34,000 fuel is unloading on these cargo ships here at Perth uh, to continue to fuel the Australian economy. There's still 130,000 fuel at Perth, but the real Australian economy is on the East Coast. Sydney, doing well, over a quarter million supply there. Melbourne, almost 100,000 supply there. And again, they can all transfer via rail from Perth. Again, not super efficiently, but it, it works. Um, the U.S., not really anything changing there. No new units there. Uh, our political points are... Um, up to 465. Uh, so we're probably about four days away from being able to uh, rebuild the Americal Division, um, which would be nice. But we've got one unit here, the 160th. Oh, nope, not that unit. Uh, the 185th? Nope, not that unit. Uh, where is it? Oh, we're not in Fort Ord, that's why. Fort Ord is up here. Um, the 164th Infantry Regiment, uh, the final formation in the Americal Division. Uh, we have the 182nd and the 132nd, both in the Pacific Fleet, both based out of San Diego. Um, and we need to change the 164th uh, to a unrestricted headquarters to the specific headquarters specifically. So then we can reform the Americal Infantry Division, which was a famous infantry division in World War II for its actions in the Pacific. And that'll give us a crack unit to begin the counteroffensives. Uh, we probably won't have it for four or five days, assuming we spend political points on nothing else, uh, which is what I'm trying to do. One question I do have is with the ground units destroyed, uh, we can rebuild the ground units that are destroyed. And it might not be a terrible idea to rebuild the 4th Australian Infantry Brigade, uh, which was just destroyed, uh, I believe, at, um, at Nomaya. Um, and then it wouldn't be a disastrous idea either uh, to uh, reform the uh, 39th Australian in Battalion. The reason is these guys uh, both are part of a larger Australian division, which would be nice to form up uh, if we were able to get them back. Um, the other unit that might might be nice uh, to reform is, in fact, it's a coastal gun unit that we lost. 
or at least we lost part of it. I don't even see it on here. Okay. Maybe not. I thought there was a coastal gun unit that we lost. Maybe I'm just blind at the moment. Hmm. Doesn't look like I see it anywhere on here. So, maybe not. Actually, let's go back and check. Because there. I think it may have been... We may not have gotten the whole thing to unload because of unload rec restrictions. So... No, not them. Maybe they're at Bris Brisbane? Yeah. No. Yeah! Hell yeah! So the 5th Royal Australian Coastal Artillery Regiment did not completely unload at Nomaya, which means even though the unit was destroyed at Nomaya, it wasn't destroyed. We only lost about half the unit because we couldn't get the rest unloaded because of port restrictions. We couldn't get... We got most of the infantry unloaded, but we couldn't get the rest unloaded, which is nice, which means we've got a pretty solid Coastal Artillery Regiment still. Uh, at least some of its heavy elements are still around. Um, we probably should hope to get it reinforced, though, because... That, we, it's, it's it's definitely depleted a bit. The gun unit survives. By the way, that's the reason we have a house rule, is because uh, you're not supposed to ever transport troops unless you have enough uh, transports to transport the whole thing. You're not allowed to evacuate fragments of units to prevent this kind of thing from happening. This was obviously not deliberate. I tried to unload the whole thing in Nomaya. Uh, I was unable to, and my ships returned to port. And by the time they got back, I realized it. And it was kind of like, okay, well, whoops, my mistake. But yeah, we're, we're supposed to have a house rule to prevent things like that because it can be an example of how you can game the system. So, oops. Um, yeah, I'm not too worried about a moving divisions up from the south of Changsha, to be honest, uh, Newhauser. So we can see over in Changsha here, he's got the bulk of his forces here. He's got troops to the east, which I'm assuming are moving west because they can't cross this water unless, they, uh, uh, unless they've unless they got no Moses with them. Um, uh, meanwhile, in the south, he does have, a, I think, a single... I think he's got a, a single unit here, and um, he could do something with it, but we actually have a th over 600 assault value here at uh, Henyang, and... Um, there's level three forts. So we'd have to shock attack across a river against something that would be bigger than any one unit that the Japanese have to bear and against level three forts. That would more or less be suicide. We also have extended a Chinese court to the west, which wouldn't have forts, but would still have over 300 assault or 240 assault value. And the fact that the Japanese would be forced to shock attack. I'm not too worried about these guys. I don't think they're going to attack here or here. They've been kind of down in this area for a while. Um, and if he moves on Sigaton, that's the one base that's a little bit weaker from a fortification perspective. It's only, I think, a level one fort at the moment. Although, no, we just upgraded to level two, nearly a thousand assault value there as well. So overall, I think the flank of Changsha is relatively well guarded unless he's going to go wide, wide left and try and go across here between Quilin and, uh, and Changsha. And I just find that highly unlikely if he does. I will pull a General Lee and extend my flank, just as when Grant was trying to go around Lee at Petersburg and extend the flank. Uh, and uh, in that case, he'd be going into uh, mountains, and uh, that would he'd get shot to pieces because he'd still be crossing a river. <laughs> Tortuga. Tortuga is not on XTRG's side, J Street. Tortuga is on my side, and if you say anything else, I will ban you from this chat. About that, anyway. Uh, Chopper Heavy, by the way, thank you for your follow. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so that's the situation right now. Not a lot else changes turn. Relatively quiet turn. Um, not a lot of ships sunk. Not a lot of ships sighted. One other thing that I just kind of like to celebrate is the fact that we have a lone cargo ship here, the Patrol Craft Zeman, which is probably going to die tomorrow to Japanese air attack because it has a level 10 out of 10 detection. But it is unloading supplies at Bataan, and it will certainly unload all of them uh, before uh, it um, before day uh, rises, and so that's that's kind of nice. I, I like to see that. Um, we're gonna go ahead and set him here. We'll have him return. I'm not even sure he can get back there with his fuel load. He can replenish from port. So he can get back there. All right. So it's unlikely that he will survive.
But if he does, yay. If he doesn't, eh. Um, he's got 233.35 supply that he should be able to unload before the sun comes up. He's already unloaded over 400 supply. So we just added 400 supply to the 38,100 supply that we're at Batan. So we got it to 38.5. Might be like half a day worth of anti-aircraft fire. Nonetheless, every little bit counts, and um, that's nice. And uh, that might be the last supply ship that comes into Bataan. We'll see. We'll see if the Japanese launch a naval attack against a lone uh, patrol craft or not. If they don't, hey, I'll kind of keep trying to sneak small amounts of supply in uh, from uh, Borneo where I can get it. Um, not a lot of bases in Borneo that still have supply, but um, I'm happy to pull supply from Tarkin or... Bellock popping as long as those bases remain open to me. Uh, the Soviets are in this mad. The Soviets are not in this yet. So the Soviets don't come into the war until 1945 historically. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Soviet units up here. You can click on them. You can look at them. You can see them. Um, you cannot order them to move into, into China. You can't actually order them to attack. Uh, you might be able to order them to build fortifications, I guess. But um, you can't actually do anything really of substance with them um, until either the historical Russian invasion on Japan or um, there are some triggers that can cause them to enter the war. If XTRG pulls too many of his troops out of Manchuria and tries to reinforce China or tries to send them to the Pacific or other places like that, um, if, he, if he falls below a certain amount of combat power in Manchuria, that can trigger an early Soviet declaration of war on, on Japan, which royally fucks Japan. Like, if Japan is that stupid to make that big of a mistake, uh, they will get rolled by China real fast. They will lose, uh, or sorry, by, uh, by the USSR real fast. They will lose massive amounts of victory points because their armies will just be steamrolled by the Russian bear. And, um, you know, maybe not as quickly in 42, but the Russian troops get get much more powerful later on. Um, so really, if Japan decides to go to war with Russia, it's a, they can do it. Is a bad. It's a real, really bad idea. Um, they could, uh, they could, they could lose all of China and and Manchuria because of it, and they would definitely lose the war because of it. I haven't. I mean, I'm hoping to hit his tiny carrier task force. I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, so right now the Russians are just observing the Japanese, per the history. Um, Matt, I wouldn't say they barely fought the Japanese. In 45, they steamrolled the Japanese, and there was a lot of very bloody fighting. It was brief, but uh, they they blitzkrieged the Japanese hard out of Manchuria. It was, you're right, it was only a short period of time, but uh, they crushed the Japanese. They, they took everything they learned against the Germans, and they faced off against a far less mechanized uh, ground force and just crushed them. Yeah, I don't, I'm, so I don't, I'm not going to delve too far into the politics of uh, the reason Japan surrendered. I think there was, there, there's definitely indications that the Japanese thought the Soviet Union would, would barter and would allow the, would sort of be the negotiator that would bring America to the table. And so there was thoughts that the Russians could sort of be this, this third party, this new, neutral arbiter that could give Japan a better peace term than what America was willing to do. Um, they were completely, you know, it was just wishful thinking. The Soviets had no intention of doing this, but, uh, but the Japanese thought maybe they would. And then when the Jap when the Russians did invade Manchuria, that crushed any illusion in the Japanese leadership that the Soviets obviously would be a neutral third party. And so that perhaps more than any of the actual combat results in Manchuria, just the fact that this potential out of the war with America was gone, certainly would have had an impact on the Japanese willingness to surrender. I think the Japanese were just in overall shocked how quickly their armies were steamrolled in Manchuria. But there wasn't really any... I mean, the troops in Manchuria were largely trapped there anyway. It's not like there was this thought of like, oh, they can come back to the home islands and save us against the Americans. I think, you know, there was, there was a recognition the Americans controlled the sea. And, um, you know, I, I don't know how much the actual victories played a role or if it was just the fact that uh, the, the Japanese no longer had sort of this potential get out of jail free card that they thought they might have.
Big Mac, stupid game wins stupid prizes. Is this a Taylor Swift joke? Uh, the Gurkha unit that crushed the ties can be formed into a division. Can it? Oh, it can. 16th in, in Indian Brigade. Um, 63rd, 16th, and the 48th is already at Pegu. The 16th is the one that we're looking at. The 63rd is... The 63rd is the one crossing the mountains. So when it crosses the mountains in three weeks, when it gets to Rangoon, we'll form into a division. But yeah, Pumbaa, I mean, I it's pretty fanciful to say that the Soviets' victory is what caused the Japanese to uh, to surrender. That's that's not so much true. Um, I think the main thing was more of just like this idea that they weren't gonna they weren't gonna be able to rely on the, the Soviets to negotiate with the Americans for them. That that may have had an impact. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this episode of War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition against XTRG. Uh, we will join you guys next time and see how things play out in uh, the South Pacific now that Nomaya has finally fallen. We will see if XTRG launches another assault on Changsha now that he has uh, failed to resume the attack after several days. I think it's unlikely, but if he does it, I think it will favor us pretty greatly. We'll see how things play out, though, next time around. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer, as always, saying thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I'm out.